Welcome to the information session on the expansion of Lighthouse. My name is Deputy Registrar Elizabeth Evans and I am the Project Manager of Lighthouse. Before we begin today's session, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land on which we are meeting today, and I also pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. To begin our session today, I would like to play a brief message from the Chief Justice, the Honourable William Ulstergren. I would like to welcome everyone attending today's webinar on this important occasion in our court's history. I'm delighted that the Lighthouse Project is expanding and thank you for attending to learn some crucial information about the program and how these processes will work with our case management pathway to benefit Australian families. As we all know, the prevalence of family violence in Australia is a national disgrace. I spoke, spoke recently at the National Family Law Conference in Adelaide about the court's focus on family violence and the improvements we are making to prioritise and address this serious issue. The Lighthouse model is a world-leading risk assessment model which has already been piloted very successfully in Adelaide, Brisbane and Parramatta. From Monday 28 November this year, the Lighthouse Project is expanding to all 15 major registries across Australia in our courts. It is an important and clear demonstration of our court's focus on family, safety and risk. The Lighthouse Project plays an essential role in the court's response to cases which may involve risk of harm caused by family violence, mental health, drug and alcohol misuse and child abuse, and of course neglect, by shaping the allocation of our resources and prioritising those in such cases. The Lighthouse Project has two primary goals, supporting the health and wellbeing of families and litigants by providing assistance and referrals to services at the commencement of proceedings and choosing the most appropriate case management pathway for each case based on its level of risk. Today's session is important. It will provide an overview of the element or elements of the model. What this means for the experiences of families entering the courts, what the courts have learnt, what changes can be expected upon the commencement, and where to go for information and resources. Preparing yourself and your clients for these changes is imperative. Ensuring that each one of you and your clients look at the risk screening and make sure your clients complete the risk screening and strengthen the support we can provide for them through the family law system. It also further helps the overarching purpose of our Act and the core principles of the Central Practice Direction. The first of which is the prioritisation of safety of children, vulnerable parties and litigants. As part of this project, we are learning more about the prevalence of this unacceptable behaviour. Stakeholders working closely with vulnerable parties have consistently said that the levels of family violence were in fact much higher than has been previously reported. And now court's data independently supports that view. We know the model works to identify and address family violence and safety risk concerns. The data from the Lighthouse Project is shocking and supports the belief that family violence in our society is much higher than previously identified. 60% of litigants are screening in the highest risk category, 60%. The court specialist family counsellors have identified 76% of parties have experienced family violence. 64% have concerns for their children's emotional and psychological well-being, and 63% have mental health concerns. The safety of children and families is the highest priority of our courts. The expansion of the Lighthouse model demonstrates the court's focus on family safety issues and how we are taking tangible steps to prevent the impact of family violence. I have no doubt that Lighthouse will improve outcomes for families in the family law system. I commend it to you. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Justice. 
Today's session will provide a broad overview on the elements of the model, what this means for the experiences of families entering the family law courts, what the courts have learnt, what changes to expect upon commencement, and where to go to for information and resources. Joining me today will be CEO and Principal Registrar David Pringle, Senior Judicial Registrar Anne-Marie Rice, Executive Director, National Registrar Operations and Practice, Senior Court Child Expert Bianca Steele, the Court Children's Service Lighthouse National Coordinator. To commence the session, I'd like to welcome David Pringle. Thank you, Elizabeth. Whilst always considering risk, the Court's recent reforms, implemented in September 2021, focus primarily on harmonisation, efficiencies and reducing delays. We adjusted who did what kind of work, moving procedural work to registrars and freeing up judges. We have ramped up dispute resolution, including in parenting cases, resolving cases better and earlier. And we harmonise family law practice across the courts with a harmonised notice of risk, family law rules, practice directions, forms and even our websites. Now, the Lighthouse expansion is part of an ongoing but enhanced focus on identifying and addressing risk. In addition to comprehensive family violence and trauma-informed training for judges, registrars and court child experts, this next phase is all about a deep dive into family violence and other risks and identifying those risks as early as possible. In order to do this, there is a specialist, highly trained team screening matters for their level of risk. Depending on that level of risk, a tailored case management approach will be adopted. The highest level of risk will see matters placed on the specialised Evert list. Medium to lower levels of risk will see different approaches taken, such as directing matters to early dispute resolution where it is safe to do so. So you can see why we have adopted the lighthouse as the symbol of this model. The lighthouse shines a light on what may be there and guides you forward. Likewise, the lighthouse model illuminates risk and provides guidance and support to families at risk of family violence, alcohol or drug misuse, mental health concerns and other risk behaviours. It's all about effectively supporting people at risk and adjusting case management to deal with that risk. This model may feel a little different, especially for those outside the pilot registries. That's understandable. It's groundbreaking stuff, being observed not just nationally, but internationally. But you should feel totally confident that you can trust this model. As you will hear from other presenters in detail today, it's safe, and the information from the screen is confidential and inadmissible. It's been specially developed for family law cases in our courts. It has well-trained and highly qualified experts throughout each stage of the pathway. It will provide tailored case management specific to your client's case. And, importantly, it has a specially resourced high-risk list dedicated to the cases that need the highest level of support. As you hear more detail about how the model works, about the health support, the specialised skill and tailored case management, please consider what a profound difference you might make in your clients' lives and their children's lives just by encouraging them to screen and to screen early. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thanks, David. The next section of today's session will focus on the risk screening process, key legislation, and the Family Doors Triage Risk Screen, which has been developed specifically for use within the courts. To commence this section, I'd like to welcome Senior Judicial Registrar, Anne-Marie Rice. Thanks, Liz. The Lighthouse Screen is underpinned by a policy of confidentiality and inadmissibility. We want parties to know that it's safe to complete the risk screen and that any concerns they raise will be taken seriously. 
Part 2A of the Family Law Act protects the confidentiality of the risk screen and prevents the disclosure and admission into evidence of any information provided in connection with a family safety risk screening process. In particular, this means that a party cannot be asked to disclose the fact that they have undertaken the screen. The screen responses and all that follows cannot be used as evidence and any information provided to a triage counsellor in the course of conducting risk screening also cannot be disclosed or used as evidence. This means that the answers or discussions with the triage counsellor cannot appear in any subsequent affidavits and in fact the judge, the senior judicial registrar and any judicial registrar involved in the matter also will not see that material. Part 5 of the amended parenting practice direction to come into effect also on the 28th of November covers the confidentiality and inadmissibility of the risk screening process and practitioners are encouraged to understand that practice direction. So why do we focus so heavily on confidentiality? There's a few reasons. Victims might be reluctant to disclose risk openly if they fear they might be exposed to cross-examination and the associated secondary trauma. The family doors triage has relatively little probative value. It invites information to be given at a single point in time. By contrast, the notice of child abuse, family violence or risk must still be filed and that document provides the detailed sworn statements in relation to specific allegations. The confidentiality of the screen prevents systems abuse and misuse and also confidentiality enhances the supporting initiatives, particularly those employed by the court in relation to co-location and information sharing practices. The screen is not an evidence gathering tool. It's been designed for a different purpose and it exists to encourage the provision of information based on feelings rather than a description of events. Evidence of risk should continue to be provided through other admissible means such as affidavits, notice of risk, subpoenaed material and expert reports. In addition, if the screen were not confidential and voluntary, the court's concerned that victims might be reluctant to disclose openly for fear of being exposed to cross-examination or for fear of um, the screen being used as a form of systems abuse by a party refusing to screen or delaying participation until the completion of the screen, and as I mentioned, by potentially cross-examining victims on their answers to the screen. You and your clients can have confidence in the confidentiality of the screen and its contents, and this is a crucial part of the Lighthouse and Ever pathway. Thank you, Anne-Marie. We will now turn to the risk screening process. The risk screening process starts at the point of filing, whereby parties to eligible proceedings are invited to risk screen. And there are four main steps in this process. Determining eligibility, inviting parties to screen, completing the risk screen, and the triage response based on the level of risk identified. In terms of eligibility, eligible proceedings include any initiating application which seeks parenting orders or parenting and financial orders filed on or after the 28th of November. It's important here to note that the eligibility criteria is based on the date of the initiating application and the date that it was filed. Therefore, if a response is filed after the 28th of November, but that initiating application was filed prior to the 28th, unfortunately the matter will not be eligible for inclusion at, this, at that stage. Following determining the eligibility, the parties will be invited to complete the risk screen and this is done via email. To ensure that your client receives the invitation to risk screen, the courts will request that you provide your client's personal contact details at the point of filing. To support the expansion, changes have been made to the Commonwealth Courts portal. From the 28th of November, when you are filing an eligible application or response, a new section will appear, and an example of this is now shown. This section will seek your client's personal contact details solely for the purposes of inviting your client to complete the risk screen. The details provided through the Commonwealth Courts portal are provided securely and they are separated from the details provided for the purposes of contact or service. However, if you do not provide your client's details at this point or indeed include your own, the courts will subsequently contact you again to request this information. This will be done 
via email. An example of this email is now shown. And we'll request that you provide your co client's contact details through via, via a separate online form. The provision of the personal contact details in this section or via the form is only for the purposes of risk screening. I will reiterate here, these details are securely held and are separate from any other contact details. And for all other purposes, the court will continue to contact the lawyer on record. These changes are designed to provide an opportunity to provide these details for this purpose only. We recognise that there might be concerns around disclosing certain contact information, security around devices and other safety risks that may indicate that a client won't provide those details. However, we want to reassure you that these avenues have been developed to ensure that this information can be provided confidently and securely. Following the provision of your client's contact details, the next step in the risk screening process commences. That is, the invitation to complete the risk screen. The risk screen is sent within two business days of filing and is sent via email to the nominated email address. You can see an example of what that email may look like now. This email contains important information to assist your client to complete the risk screen. More importantly, it, comp it contains their personal login details and a link to the risk screen. Shortly after receipt of this email, a secondary email follows with their unique access code. This access code expires after 10 days and reminders are sent both via email and SMS to encourage parties to complete the risk screen. We know that the majority of parties complete the risk screen within 48 hours of receiving that invitation. However, if the access ha code happens to expire, you can always contact the Lighthouse team for it to be reset. I'd now like to welcome senior court child expert Bianca Steele to speak about family doors triage and the role of the family counsellor. Thanks, Bianca. Thanks, Liz. In 2012, Professor Jen McIntosh developed DOORS, the detection of overall risk screen. For more information about this risk screen, there is website availability of the DOORS handbook. Shortly after development, Relationships Australia South Australia joined with Professor McIntosh in modifying DOORS into an online web-based application, which RASA continues to use for all of their clients upon entry into their organisation. There are three critical aspects which made DOORS particularly attractive to the courts. The first is the reliability and validity of the screen in accurately determining and classifying risk. Research highlighted there was consistency in reported perception about risk despite separation and conflict. This means that the risk screen is considered reliable for classifying risk in the event where only one party has completed the screen. The second is the capacity for large-scale screening, which was enabled by RASA's website adaption. And thirdly, DOORS covered the broad range of risk indicators that family law people and families often present with at the time of filing. This includes family violence, both the experience of family violence as well as the perpetration, mental health, drug and alcohol misuse, child abuse and neglect, co-parenting conflict and communication, child well-being, parenting stress and vulnerability, and other major stressors such as employment, housing, income and health. Additionally, the three-part framework enables different levels of exploration of individual and family functioning after separation, with a focus on identifying risks to safety, parents' well-being and children's well-being. However, further adaption and modification of the original DOORS framework was required for the courts due to the large population, as well as needing the tool to assist with initial triage and prioritisation of matters into high, medium and low classifications. As you can see, the risk screen is structured into three parts, much the same as the original doors. Door one is about a particular area of need or concern, which covers 10 key domains focused on safety, risk and well-being. When a party indicates medium or high risk at this stage, the second part of the risk screen is generated, door two. Door two is the party's perception about how they feel they are coping, what supports they have in place, their willingness, capacity and access those supports, that is family, friends or professionals, and their confidence in help-seeking behaviours. If medium or high risk continues to be indicated at this stage, then the third part of the risk screen is generated, door three. 
Door three is where the party develops their own safety and wellbeing plan. The focus here is on, is on assisting the party to take action regarding theirs or their children's safety and wellbeing, specifically what steps they might take. This is an example of one question in the risk screen. The risk screen can be completed on a mobile phone, tablet, laptop or PC. As you can see, all the questions are framed to elicit a yes-no response using radio buttons. There is no option for narrative text. This is because the intention is to gather information about the client's perception and feelings rather than about a specific incident or event which are captured in the notice of risk and the filed affidavit material. Because of this, the language is considered soft and feelings or behavioural based. The structure of the questions and the language used is written to a grade 6 literacy level. This enables a good portion of our client population to use the tool with ease. Writing to this level also means that it's easily interpretable for people where English is their second language. If people require assistance with completing the screen, they can come into the registry where iPads and staff will be able to assist and support them. We also know that family members, friends and legal practitioners support people in completing the screen. However, it is imperative that support is limited to that, not to the completion of the screen itself. On average, it takes about 15 minutes to complete. The person must answer all of the questions in order for the risk screen to be completed. There is no capacity to skip questions. When a party receives a high-risk classification, a triage counsellor will conduct a clinical review of the filed material and where appropriate and required will offer the party a triage interview. The triage counsellors are highly qualified professionals who are either social workers, psychologists or hold a relevant social science degree such as counselling. They have extensive clinical experience working with children and families across a range of areas including working with children and families who have experienced family and domestic violence. The focus of the interview is on strengthening the safety and well-being for the party and for the children. This includes the development of a bespoke safety and well-being plan and identification of referrals for support services which might assist. Where an interview does not occur, the triage counsellor will email the party the DOORS generated safety and well-being plan. As a reminder, a party's involvement with a triage counsellor is confidential and, in and inadmissible, as is all resulting documentation from this interview, including referrals to agencies. The confidentiality and inadmissibility provisions are intended to ensure that a family safety risk screening person, including an officer of the court or family counsellor, cannot be compelled to disclose risk screening information, including to a state or territory agencies, or in the context of proceedings in state or territory courts or tribunals. These provisions are to ensure that parties freely and confidentially and confidently participate in the family safety risk screening process without fear that the information they provide may be used against them in other contexts. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks, Bianca. Our next section will focus on the Evett list. And I now welcome back Anne-Marie to commence this section. As you've heard, the lighthouse is used as a symbol for both internal and external guidance to slow down and to think deeply about what's happening in that particular matter. The purpose of Ebbett is to provide a carefully managed, timely case management pathway for high risk matters. But it's also about supporting people and families at risk and strengthening safety and well-being for children by adjusting case management as required. The list has, at its core, a philosophy of remaining hopeful and resilient and not losing sight of the fact that people who have experienced and perpetrated family violence or other risk factors can improve their parenting capacity. Making safe orders is necessary to guide children and parents to safety and the list allows for the effective prioritisation of the court's resources. However, even if a matter is not ultimately placed on the Everett list, that does not mean there is no risk involved. 
The court will continue to case manage the matter in a risk-informed manner and hopes that practitioners will also continue to bring to the court information about the dynamics and nuances of family violence present in particular matters. The Evett List is the specialist list for Division 2 of the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia. And whether you are a judge, a registrar, a case manager, a legal practitioner or an independent children's lawyer, seeing a case on the Evett list signals that it will be carefully managed in accordance with the practice direction. The Family Law Practice Direction Evett list sets out the criteria that matters need to meet in order to be included formally on the Evett list. Practitioners should be familiar with that practice direction. Matters will be placed onto the Evett list consistently with that criteria. In order to be considered for inclusion on the list, an applicant or a respondent must have completed the screen. They must have screened as high risk and have been referred by the triage counsellor to the Evett Registrar for consideration. All of this will occur prior to the first return date of the matter, and that date may be varied depending on whether the matter is placed in the Evett list or not. If both parties screen, then the highest risk screen will determine the case management pathway. However, parties can't request that a matter be placed on or transferred to the Evett list. The pathway to the list is the completion of a screen and the risk category identified in that screen as being high. The decision of a judicial registrar to place or indeed not place a matter on the Evett list is final and as an administrative decision, it's not reviewable. At the time of the referral to the Evett Registrar, the Magellan List criteria will also be considered so that the most appropriate case management pathway for that particular matter can be implemented, including, where appropriate, the transfer to Division 1 of the Court for inclusion in the Magellan List. There are some key components you can see in the slide presented to you now about how the Evett case management pathway works in a practical sense. If the matter is not determined to meet the Evett criteria and is not placed on the list, it will proceed to its first return date and there will be no indications that either party has completed a screen. If the matter is found to be suitable for the Evett list, then the Lighthouse Risk Screen will have done its job and has shed light on the risk dynamic of that particular matter. And practitioners should continue to take careful, thoughtful instructions and to ensure that the evidence placed before the court matches that level of identified risk. The Evert Judicial Registrar will, on the first occasion, make orders in chambers for the early gathering of information, including by obtaining information from the co-located officials or the making of Section 69ZW orders. They will also then begin the intensive case management required for the matter. The expectation of practitioners is that you will also act in a timely manner and ensure compliance with all of the orders. The first appearance in the Evett list will occur within a very short time frame of the designation of the matter and parties and their representatives are expected to attend via a Microsoft Teams link or as otherwise directed by the Judicial Registrar. Parties will be heard at that first appearance about the appointment of an independent children's lawyer, if that has not already occurred at the Chambers event, and on the further directions for the progress of the matter. That might include moving quickly to a child impact report and to a prioritised interim defendant hearing. Both of those events, the report interviews and the interim hearing, are prioritised for Evett matters. The interim defended hearing, which will take place before a senior judicial registrar, is to occur within three months of the matter having been placed on the Evett list. And the expectation is that detailed information will be available to the senior judicial registrar, including, by way of child impact report, the material produced under the section 69ZW orders, by the independent reports, or any information that's been obtained by the independent children's lawyer. Judicial registrars and chambers have a positive duty to consider what safety issues are required to be addressed for all parties appearing in the court. Practitioners should also be proactive about identifying risks and developing and communicating to the court all relevant safety plans for each matter. Once the matter has proceeded to an interim defended hearing, it might then be considered for safe and appropriate dispute resolution 
depending on the circumstances of the matter and including whether or not any financial proceedings are also on foot. The matter will, after the interim defended hearing, continue to be closely case managed by the Everett Registrar and it will ultimately, if it is not able to be resolved, proceed to mention and preparation for a priority compliance and readiness hearing. Practitioners should carefully consider how the expert evidence that they obtain can be sought in a timely manner and be ready and able to inform the court about the information that will be needed in the matter by the time of trial. If parenting and financial proceedings are on foot, then both of those causes of action would need to be in a state of readiness for trial and the Everett Registrars will carefully manage all aspects of the matter to ensure that it progresses in a timely way. Everett Matters will receive consistent treatment at the compliance and readiness hearing so that they are able to move to a trial within the timeframes expected within that list. Some really informa important information and data has been extracted from the pilot sites that gives practitioners and the court really important information in relation to matters that are forming part of the Evert list and the screening process. We know that about 72% of matters have had at least one party screening. And this is an indication that parties want to take up the opportunity to screen when they are given it. Interestingly, 53% of the parties who complete the screen are applicants, so an even balance in terms of applicants and respondents bringing their concerns to the court in this way. And 54% of parties who complete the screen are female, while 46% are male. Of the matters that do complete a screen, a very significant percentage, 60%, screen as high risk. And interestingly, 44% of litigants have indicated that one of the reasons why they completed the risk screen was because they wanted to put their safety concerns before the court. So the court finds it really encouraging that so many practitioners are supportive of the initiative and it's hoped that solicitors and counsel will not only continue to support the screen but continue to maintain the skills necessary to speak with clients about risk factors including in domestic and family violence and to prepare material in a manner that's consistent with the concerns of that particular matter. Since the 1st of November 2020, it's been mandatory in both courts for each party to file a Notice of Child Abuse, Family Violence or Risk, the Notice of Risk, in every proceeding where parenting or parenting and property orders are sought. And you can see from the table now that these statistics show that domestic and family violence is the most frequently identified risk factor, followed by child abuse or risk of abuse. 89% of matters that are filed in the courts have identified as having one or more of these risk factors present. 84% have two or more risk factors alleged and 77% have three or more risk factors alleged. But 66%, two thirds of matters filed in the courts have allegations that four or more of these risk factors are present. The data collected during the Everett pilot supports these risk occurrences and these risk types, and the court takes them seriously. The information that's contained in the Notice of Risk then allows the courts to fulfil our obligations under the Family Law Act to notify child welfare agencies if there is an allegation made that a child to whom the proceedings relate has been abused or is at risk of abuse, or if there has been family violence or a risk of family violence that amounts to abuse of a child. In the most recent financial year, 76% of parenting matters filed with the court were mandatorily referred to the relevant child welfare agencies. The data collected from the notice of risk provides an indication of the significant level of risk that's faced by parties to family law proceedings. And this of course impacts on the complexity of proceedings and on the careful and considered way in which those cases must be triaged, assessed and case managed. The courts acknowledge that not all parties will be prepared to disclose information about risk in their filed court documents. As a result, the proportion of matters in which allegations of child abuse, family violence or other risks are identified in the notice is not necessarily representative of the true level of risk being experienced by parties to proceedings. And in addition, some parties may not realise that what they are experiencing amounts to family violence or constitutes another type of risk to themselves or their child. 
and the risk screen helps to plug these gaps. The courts acknowledge that risk is dynamic and can change throughout the course of proceedings. And because of this, new risk issues might arise after the commencement of proceedings. And the rules require a person who becomes aware of new facts or circumstances that would amount to an allegation of child abuse or family violence to file a fresh notice of risk, setting out those facts and supported by an affidavit. The court is constantly looking at risk and at its changing dynamics and practitioners should be doing this as well. Of the matters that are referred by the triage councillors to the Evert Judicial Registrar, 30% will ultimately be placed on the Evert list and managed in that intensive way. This means that a number of matters which have screened as high risk will continue to be managed in the standard case management pathway. All registrars operating in lists and in dispute resolution conferences do so with a risk and a trauma-informed process. As you have heard, the distinguishing feature of the Evert list is early access to the information necessary to enable careful and informed decision making. This includes time to gather detailed information early, the early appointment of independent children's lawyer, lawyers and the prioritisation of child impact reports and interim defended hearings. We know that this works. Positive feedback has been received from parties and practitioners involved in the Evert list in the court's pilot sites, and significantly, 88% of Evert list matters have been finalised prior to a hearing. Thank you, Anne-Marie. I'll now just briefly turn to some information and resources. From the 28th of November, the court's website will be updated to reflect the details of the expansion. There will be comprehensive information available to support you and your clients for the commencement of Lighthouse. This includes translated fact sheets, Evert list guides and FAQs. We encourage you to refer to these resources now. This brings us to the conclusion of the formal presentation and in advance of today's session, we've received a number of questions and I'd now like to take the opportunity to put these questions to our panellists today. So, the first question is, if a matter only seeks financial orders initially and then includes parenting orders, will the matter be eligible to risk screen? And Maria, I might ask this of you. Thanks, Elizabeth. The short answer to that question is yes, providing that the initiating application was filed after the 28th of November 2022, then our systems will pick up any matters which start as financial only matters and subsequently have parenting orders included either by the applicant or by the respondent. Once the parenting cause of action is commenced, both the applicant and the respondent will be able to uh, be invited to, to screen and the matter as a whole becomes eligible for consideration for the Evert list. Thanks, Anne-Marie. I think the next question is really important. The next question asks, how can I assist my client to complete the risk screen? Bianca, I might put this one to you. Sure. This is a really important question and we do get a lot of questions from practitioners about how they can support their clients. Firstly, probably the most important thing is, is that the risk screen must be completed by the client themselves and from their perspective. To have someone else complete it on their behalf would mislead the process, it could skew the risk classification and it could result in the incorrect allocation and or management of the matter by the court. So in terms of directly assisting the client, you can assist them to understand the questions, so reading them the questions, um, and you could provide them with access to the online application and translation. There are also a range of fact sheets on the website which have been translated that might assist you and your client. Lastly, the client can attend the registry to access support. Each registry will have iPads and staff available to assist and support clients completing the risk screen. Thanks, Bianca. I think this question really touches on confidentiality. The question is, can my client discuss the results of the risk screen and the triage interview with me? And Marie, I think I might put this one to you again. Thanks, Elizabeth. This is a really important topic for practitioners. Your client may choose to disclose the fact that they have completed the risk screen or even the content of some of their answers to the risk screen. But it is absolutely essential that you advise them about the fact that this is confidential protected information. 
you must advise them about the effect of Part 2A of the Act, including that all information that's received or generated through the risk screening process, which includes the risk screen itself and any triage and subsequent referrals, is protected. Of course, all communications that you have with your client are also protected by solicitor-client privilege. And it's important that you think carefully about how you might bring any necessary evidence before the court based on information that your client has discussed with you in that confidential dynamic. I think it's also worth noting that in the almost three years since Part 2A came into effect and the pilot began, no one has made an application to access the protected information, nor have there been any issues in relation to disclosure. The confidentiality of the risk screening process has really been respected as an integral part of the Lighthouse model. Should your client wish to discuss the outcomes with you, they would be discreet discussions and they need to be handled with sensitivity and with um, a reflection of the confidential nature of the way you gather that information. Thanks, Anne-Marie. And the final question that we've received today, what if my matter was filed before the 28th of November 2022? And Marie, I might put that one to you again. Unless the matter uh, was already included in one of the pilot lighthouse registries, then matters filed prior to the 28th of November are unable to be retrospectively risk screened. The commencement of the expansion is 28 November 2022. And the commencement date for eligibility ensures that the courts can commit to the resourcing and the national approach from a common and consistent point in time. To make exceptions creates uncertainty in matters already in progress and where those risk factors need to be very carefully managed. It's also really important to note that for both existing matters and for those filed after the commencement of Lighthouse, that the current processes for dealing with urgent applications, including because there's been a change in risk, are not altered. Parties who seek urgent interim hearing should continue to approach the court in the usual way by requesting a date for urgency. If the matter is eligible for a screen, then that will be provided to parties to complete in parallel with the progression of the matter to an urgent interim hearing. Thank you, Anne-Marie. And thank you to everyone who has joined us today. That includes the substantive section of our presentation. And I'd now like to invite David Pringle to close the session. Thank you, Elizabeth. Now that you've heard all about Lighthouse and the Evett List, the question is not, why should someone screen, but why not? And we think the answer is clear. Everyone should screen because everyone benefits from the process. So what are the key take home points? One, discuss Lighthouse with your clients and encourage them to screen. Do this early on in the advice process and encourage them to screen early. Two, Lighthouse is safe confidential and inadmissible. You can trust that the screen is protected. And while we need to contact your clients directly so that they can screen, you can trust that we will only do that for the screening process and not otherwise. Three, the Lighthouse judges, registrars, triage counsellors and staff are specially trained in this model and more broadly in family violence it's important to take advantage of this specialised skill. Four, the pathway will be tailored to your client's case, including referral to the Evett list or referral to dispute resolution where appropriate. Remember, the Evett list gets intensive support to deal with complex issues, but complexity does not mean a slower pathway. The pilot experience has in fact been the opposite a swift and effective outcome. Finally, the courts consider your role in this reform to be critical. As family law practitioners, we know that you care not only about the legal issues in your clients' cases, but that you care deeply about the real life outcomes for your clients and their children. Lighthouse represents an opportunity to ensure that your clients and their children get the best support possible and can be guided during one of the most difficult times in their lives through the most effective and well-resourced pathways adjusted to the needs of their case. On behalf of the courts, 
I want to thank you in anticipation of the fundamentally important role that you will play in supporting this groundbreaking initiative, whilst at the same time supporting your clients and their children.